Hi everybody, my name is Dora Kerme. I'm an author, performance coach, and former professional table tennis player in New York. You are listening to the Game Sat Match podcast. Have you ever wondered how the greats of any industry are always able to perform at a high level, even under pressure? What is their secret? In this episode of Game Sat Match, I interview my good friend Adam Bobro, the voice of table tennis. We will talk about his life lessons, challenges, role models, and mentors in his life, how he started playing table tennis, and why he wants to grow and promote the sport. So Adam, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate that we can do this. Likewise. And yeah, so you are an amazing person and you wear so many hats. And I would like to talk about what you are the most proud of during your career because you have many accomplishments in many different ways, right? That's interesting. I, uh, wow, you caught me at an interesting point in my life. <laughs> I think a lot about what it means to be proud uh, and why we take pride in things. I try to take pride in everything that I do, I think, um, and it's a fine balance. So in terms of any individual accomplishment, huh, it's a great question. <laughs> the next hour is me thinking about what I'm proud <laughs> we, we, of. We, we, can, we, can, we can move on to the next one if you want to and come back. I'll try to give myself, I don't know if I'm going to come up with a simple single answer. I mean, I think everything is a work in progress. I think I'm thrilled with the things that have worked out so far. Uh, I'm thrilled to be alive and excited about accomplishing the things that, I don't know, I just, yeah, I mean, I think... The struggles that I've made it through so far, uh, I'm thrilled to have made it through. And at the same time, I'm excited and encouraged by any positive results that I've seen along the way. And yeah, I guess I have lots to look forward to. So I don't feel finished with anything really yet, but I'm excited that there's been progress. Okay. So um, you, you mentioned that you went through it's so my root many... Beer. <laughs> my root beer burp. So basically, I'm proud of nothing. <laughs> no, no yeah, but yeah. I mean, it's so interesting. You didn't say anything. So that's, um, like, that's what know, my job. You, what I, I, I've seen is that you inspired many people to play table tennis. And, and also, I've seen that you have so many YouTube uh, followers, which is amazing how you made it. That was a very quick rise, right? Oh. So I'm, I'm fascinated that you didn't mention these. Also, you were commentating, and you are still commentating, right? For yeah. ITTF, you traveled around the world. Everyone knows you in table tennis, basically. And you make people laugh. And you educate people as well at the same time. I hope so. So I, I, and, But as just <clears throat> that's the work side, right? But also there are other things as well. So you, you know, it's interesting to hear that you were not mentioning this. Proud is a very tricky word for mm -hmm. me. I think it implies something that's... I'm thankful for a lot of things. I'm thankful that any of the things that I've done from commentating to making videos has resonated with anybody. Uh, I'm very thankful for that. Um, when I meet someone in the park or on the street or anywhere who expresses that they've been touched in some way or moved or affected positively in any way by something that I've done, I'm very thankful for that. I don't know if I'd say proud. I'm happy. I'm happy that it's worked out. I'm happy to hear that people are positively affected. Proud for me is just an interesting word. I don't know exactly where to draw the line. But yeah, I'm very thankful that I've been able to enjoy what I do and that I've been able to do a lot of it, that I've been able to sort of do something that makes me feel a sense of belonging, a sense of meaning, like that I, interacting with other people is very important to me. Uh, I really like it. And if I can help anyone along the way, that's a great thing. I'd love to be able to do that. So I try. And when I hear that someone started playing table tennis because of me, that's really cool because I love table tennis and I'd love for people to experience, you know, the best sides of it like, like I try to or have been fortunate enough to on many occasions over the years. 
And, uh, but more importantly, when someone says like, hey, you helped me get through a tough time, or you reminded me that it's okay to be a bit weird, or anything, you know? Um, I used to think this, and now suddenly, like, I, my relationship is improved with so-and-so because I realized, like, we don't choose where we're born or who our parents are or our family members or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I hope to be able to comfort people, to offer some sort of support, encouragement, relief. Um, yeah, just a lot of positive stuff. So I'm very thankful that, I guess more and more people seem to be receptive to what I'm doing. I'm very thankful for that. And uh, yeah, I don't know, I look forward to all sorts of opportunities and I'm trying to keep my eyes open and adjust accordingly to, to make the most of my time on Earth. Okay, great. I, I think you make people very comfortable. Awesome, thank you. I'm just saying that to you because you have a very um, I mean, your approach is very diverse, and Tibetanese is so diverse. Yeah, it is. So I just wanted to point it out to you that you make people comfortable, and it's a big gift. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say, can you lift your arm for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> thank was, you, thank uh, you, thank you. Very funny. My pleasure. <laughs> <As usually. laughs> thanks. No, I think whenever, uh, maybe it's living in Asia for six years or so, but when you get a compliment, the, the natural thing to do is to sort of counterbalance it. Oh, so okay. I figured I'd so try to make not, it really yeah, uncomfortable yeah. really quickly. No, um, yeah, table tennis is a very global sport, and I think people who've, you know, you and I have both had the privilege to play, I mean, New York is so diverse that even if you just lived here your whole life, which you haven't, you've traveled the world with the sport, even just living here. Being at, you know, any of the local pods or any, you know, Bryant Park, you get to meet people from all over the world, which is sort of an education in understanding people and getting along with people. And yeah, I think you and I have both traveled quite a bit and it gives us a chance to sort of learn about people, which helps us understand people and treat them the way we might want to, to create lasting relationships. So yeah, table tennis, fortunately for us, is a very global sport. We, we talked about a little bit about challenges, that what challenges you had to go through during your career and how did you overcome those? Challenges in career. Huh, well, I think you know, in life, people need to feed themselves and money helps people do that a lot. And sometimes you realize, oh, my passion doesn't line up with making money. Uh, and I chose acting as a career. I studied acting in college and I knew that it was a big gamble, that it wasn't a secure way to make a living and feed yourself. So I knew it would be a challenge and I thought, well, I better be really frugal. I better save money. So I'm going to cook everything at home and I'm going to play table tennis, but I'm not going to go to movies. And if I go to dance clubs, I'm just going to dance. I'm going to keep my expenses low because I don't want to have to quit acting. So I did that for a long time. I've lived a very cheap life um, to make sure that I didn't have to quit my passions. Um, they've transformed a bit over the years. I've sort of found ways to combine my love for performance and entertainment with my favorite sport, which is table tennis. It's still the root beer. I almost never drink carbonated beverages except kombucha, and this one is gonna I'm, make... I, I love kombucha, I never tried this one actually. Yeah, mixed feelings, we'll review it later, but I just wanted people who are watching to know why I'm so burpy today. You might need to carry me and bounce me a little bit, burp me. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. It'd be very, that'd be the fascinating interview yeah no definitely, definitely that's how comfortable we are yes <laughs> i shouldn't have told you that <laughs> you're you really now so pushing yes. the buttons yes okay now i got it <laughs> I, I was waiting for, uh, it's okay um let's see challenges that i've overcome i think with public work when you do stuff that you know as more and more people start to watch um you can't please everybody and that's something that I would love to please everybody. I wish I could. And I say that, and I don't know what it would really be like. Maybe it'd be annoying if I pleased everybody all the time and no one had a problem with me. Um, but it seems fairly ideal. Have no enemies, have no one who wants to cause you harm or see you fail. That'd be great, I think. Um, but the truth is, you can't please everybody, and so you learn about haters and 
how to manage that, what to pay attention to and what not to, what to let get to you and what not to. That's been a challenge. Um, overwhelmingly, I'm very thankful that you know the community around me or what I'm doing in the sport, let's say, has been very supportive and very mindful. And I, I think I meet people all the time that I'm like, wow, this person's amazing. Like this person's maybe, I don't know, like could be a role model to me or I could learn a lot from this person. I'd like to have this person's company. I feel that way all the time when I meet people who introduce themselves. Um, yeah, so that's been something, just learning how to handle criticism, un, you know, uninvited, harsh criticism that mm -hmm. comes in from time to time. Um, it's interesting how when you're a public figure, you know, for men and women, I think men are judged less on their, uh, less on their physical appearance than women. Um, yeah, like I'm not wearing any makeup today and I didn't put anything in my hair after my shower. Um, and I don't think, I probably won't get too much bad, you know, <laughs> comments because of that. But still, people will say things about your body or my body and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. No, it's my body. I Yeah, I don't know. So I wouldn't consider that a huge challenge. I'm just like, yeah, no, I am lanky. I have sloped shoulders. That's my nose. It's my face. Yeah, I'm slow. That's true compared to the pros and the young people or you. I mean, people that are properly trained. Yeah, I guess just unsolicited advice and criticism, learning how to let things slide, pick your battles. Challenges. Yeah, same challenges that anyone goes through with work that you can't always have everything you want and sometimes situations are demanding or involve compromise um, and sometimes you say something publicly and realize you put your foot in your mouth or you said something wrong, learning how to apologize or correct myself or update. Um, other challenges, traveling a lot, um, not being at home much, but I think I sort of thrive on excitement. I think if I ever wanted to have a family, I'd have to learn how to sort of be calmer and slow down. And we'll see. But in the meantime, everything seems fine enough. And if things change, I will try to change accordingly and try to recognize. I'm, I'm pretty introspective. So I try to recognize when I'm not feeling well or burnt out and say, I need a break. Or, cool, let's keep going. Yeah, I can handle more. I think I just try to make sure that I'm not falling into the trap of like always chasing money or being productive all the time, you know, stopping and smelling the roses. I think um, I try to learn from other people's mistakes as much as my own, um, but like take preventative measures. If I listen to all these interviews with people who are in their 90s and they talk about what they regret, almost nobody says, I wish I had worked harder. People say, I wish I spent more time with family. I wish I spent more time with friends. I wish I traveled. I wish I had some adventures, like creating memories and experiences. So I try to think, oh yeah, if I should live that long or not, <laughs> I just would like to do things that I will enjoy so that if I get hit by a car tomorrow, which could happen, I'll try to prevent that, but it could happen, that it's been good. I've enjoyed it and no regrets. That's, or as few regrets as possible, let's say. Wow, <laughs> you now mentioned um, and covered so many different things, but this is so great. I'm just wondering, do you have a role model? Because you also mentioned that, that it just, you know, in a couple of sentences that uh, regarding having a role model or just learning from others' mistakes or learning from oh. others. I'm just wondering if you have any role models. Yeah, lots. I mean, I take inspiration from wherever I can. So I might... Like you might be a role model to me in some way, like mentality on the table or behavior and interactions with people or generally having a good, uh, good vibe. The first time we shot our video, I was like, I feel bad because Dora had a great <laughs> attitude and I didn't. <laughs> like that was on me and I had to own up to that and be like, I'm gonna be better this time around. So in some senses, you were a role model there. Um, and it doesn't mean every night, like before I go to sleep, I'm like, what would Dora do? WWDD. I like, but there are people, you know, in my life from my father and my mother to my sister and my brother to close friends to acquaintances or public figures. I mean, 
I guess I just try to take inspiration. I mean, it could be a homeless person. It could be someone cleaning the street. It could be someone selling pretzels. It could be the person checking me in at a dentist's office. Just anyone that sort of does something that reminds me, oh yeah, I really like when that happens. I should do that for other people. Or, oh, that's a really good way to handle it. Or sometimes I, I get pouty and complain. I'm like, ah, ah. Uh, we traveled an hour to get to this tournament and when I showed up, like, it's over. And then it's like, well, what are we gonna do about it? I'm like, yeah, that's true. We can't really change that. I'm happy you're here. <laughs> I did that, I went with a friend in Taiwan and we went, to a, we went to a table tennis tournament and it had been over for an hour. They were cleaning up and it took us an hour to get there. And I was sort of like, like a baby. I was like, I wanted to complain. And my friend, she was like, she wasn't mad. She was less interested in the tournament than I was. And she's like, well, what are you gonna do? I said, yeah, that's true. Nice view, huh? <laughs> like, like I, I had a, she was my role model in that moment because mm -hmm. she had such a great attitude. It was very uh, stoic. It was just sort of like, well, what can we do about it? Let's, we might as well enjoy. And I'm like, I'm really lucky you're here because I probably would have like thrown a baby temper tantrum or just complained a lot for a while. But yeah, you're right. It's not that bad. We're here and it's nice out and now we have free time. Like, could be worse, you know? Role models, pfft, tons. I mean, it, in every, yeah, in every walk of life, everything that I do, there's someone who does something that I have to learn from. I can improve on everything that I do. So, yeah, I guess I just try to take inspiration from anywhere I can. Okay, well, thank you. And um, it sounds like you really appreciate great attitude. Yeah, I think it's important. I think uh, anything we can control uh, in life, like there are a lot of things we can't, right? I remember because you wrote the foreword in the book and you, you even wrote about your grandma, right? She had a great attitude. Attitude so is everything. I remember that, yes. Yeah, I, yeah. So it, it's a topic that it's, you know, it's coming up for you, right? So it's like, I was very right. close with my grandma, and I feel like she was quite a, she lived a successful life in the sense that most of the people who knew her, I think, really appreciated her company, having her around. Uh, I found her to be a lovely part of my life. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and added, her attitude was amazing. I think those are the people that I like the most, the people that I'm like, wow, you have such a good attitude. I just can't believe it. Like, what a pleasure to be around you, you know? When I'm feeling bad, I'm like, oh, but you seem fine. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's a great gift to give someone else, you know? The, the pleasure of nice company. And I mean, there are a handful of factors there. You know, being a good listener, being able to feel for someone, not offering unsolicited advice or criticism. Yeah, but attitude is... My grandma was really big on that, and I think she was on to something good. Oh, that's great. And um, it's great that you are passing that over to other people. Thanks. <laughs> so I would like to talk a little bit about, um, because I know that you started doing your YouTube channel, which is a big success, right? How many followers do you have right now? Oh, thanks. Uh, I think last I checked was like, 1.04 million. I guess the better way to make it seem like I'm not checking it every day is to say a little over a million. But yeah, just just recently passed a million. It's very impressive, and and I know you started during the pandemic, right? A little bit before. A little bit before. January 1st of 2019. So what made you to start your YouTube channel? Well, um, so my YouTube channel originally I started when YouTube started. Someone's like, hey, there's this website where you can put up videos and I was like like nine gag and they're like well but you can just put them up you don't need approval you can just put up anyone can do it I was like huh what's it called again they're like YouTube they're like you're into entertainment and sports and stuff I thought maybe you'd like it so I tried and in 2009 I had a video called excessive ping-pong celebration that uh, was my first viral video and it gave me a taste of like well cool you can reach a lot of people with this if something clicks or connects with people or makes people laugh. And uh, I uploaded videos on and off over the years. And in 2015, I had a negative experience with a third party company and decided, yeah, I, I'm done with YouTube. Like there are other things to use. So I just stopped. And it wasn't like I quit forever, but it, I just stopped using it for four years. And um, 
Emil from Pongfinity I had met at some ITTF events and I knew that Pongfinity had like I think 400,000 followers on Facebook and they had decided that they were going to put more of their eggs in the YouTube basket and I talked to him about that and I said yeah what's the story there and we got along well and he was very open and honest and he said he told me why he said I think YouTube will be around for a while I think it's a good system I think uh, financially it's it offers money which is a good plan to be self-sustaining and have people continue and uh, he said I think you'd be good at YouTube I think you should do it I said interesting and he mentioned some more specifics and I thought the other reason was I was thinking to myself man I've heard that over like hundreds of millions of people are listening to the commentary that I do for ITTF in a year I'm like hundreds of millions I could get fired tomorrow and have to start over at square one that's crazy to think about I'm like how can I sort of take advantage of this position in some way to build a life raft for myself and continue my goals uh, I have a lot of goals to grow table tennis and help you know grow awareness of the sport and also of course to feed myself along the way I think ideally I'd be able to feed myself promoting table tennis because then I wouldn't ever have to stop doing it right I wouldn't be like oh sorry work I want to do this other thing that's my passion so I tried to find a way to make my passion the way I feed myself um, yeah and I thought that the way I could harvest some of this you know so-called celebrity within the sport um, would be to build a like a YouTube channel where if I got fired I would still have the YouTube channel and could continue trying to grow the sport there to people so it just seemed like a decent sort of way to diversify and continue and even my plan is not to get fired in general um, <laughs> I failed at that in many jobs but my thinking is I'd love to do both I'd love to keep commentating and then without someone watching over me and saying you have to keep it this way I could also have my free way with my decisions to try from this angle and you know try to grow the sport from two different angles so and I'm open to even more I just need to be mindful because you know none of us have an infinite amount of time and energy so we only have so many hours in a day and yeah so I guess that's how the YouTube thing came to be I wanted to make a TV show and uh, still toy with the idea my brother said well you could do that on YouTube and I said yeah but if you do a TV show you could have like millions of people watching immediately like within your first season with YouTube I mean it could take years before even you might never get to a hundred thousand subscribers and he's, it's true but you're very fat but you already passed that <laughs> yeah the first year I the first year it worked out I hit a hundred thousand uh, in 2019 I started with about three thousand and then at the end of the year I had a hundred thousand I think again I had a big advantage because my job was public as a commentator so that was very fortunate um, yeah and then every year a little bit more I guess it's been growing so what 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 have you I'm, I'm pretty sure many people are so curious what helped you to become successful a, a very successful youtuber oh well yeah I guess I yeah thank you <laughs> I'm always hesitant to like it's it's all part of the like I hope that this is just a, a step in the right direction um, but to get to where I'm at right now I guess anyway in terms of numbers and whatnot I think consistency um, I slowed down a little bit in terms of making videos I decided I don't have to release one every week I think quality over quantity um, I met dude perfect during the pandemic I had an opportunity they invited me to collaborate with them and I'm like this could be an amazing learning experience and an incredible boost to my channel and I'm like these guys like I might never have an opportunity like this again I should take the risk and leave Taiwan not knowing how I'm gonna get back and uh, who knows how long it'll be before my regular commentating job comes back and it just so happened that it was a long time and it's still not fully back so yeah uh, I learned from dude perfect they were only putting up two videos a month and I'm like they have almost 53 million subscribers so there must be something to learn from them <laughs> like a lot of things to learn from them but if they don't need to put up a video every week why do I and I guess the math is 
that we, you know, I, I brought someone on to help me fairly early on. I think like anything, asking for help is important when you need it. Um, not trying anything for yourself can also be too far on one extreme, asking for help on everything. But when you realize, wow, this is a lot for me, I don't think I can sustain or keep going this way, asking for help can be important. So I mentioned that early on. I said, yeah, the, the editing. I have a lot of creative ideas, or I'm always, you know, my mind is always thinking of different things. But sitting at the computer for hours making it happen, I don't think needs to be me. I think someone else could probably do that, and it would be a better solution to make this last. I should be spending my time trying to think of the things that are either unique to me or, yeah, maybe not as common, but a lot of people can edit. Anyway, the thinking was if I release four videos a month, and they're all decent or pretty good, it'd be much more powerful. Like let's say they each get X amount of views or I release two videos a month, half as many, but they're really good. They're gonna get more than twice the views of ev you know, every video, which will, in the long run, if someone finds my channel years from now, I mean, most people don't know my channel right now. And I think as long as I'm alive, most people won't. That's just, we'll see. And I'll do what I can to change that, but that's just one way of saying that there are bigger YouTubers out there all over the place. Um, if anyone stumbles across my channel years from now and they find that every video they click on is like quality, they're like, whoa, this took a lot of, this person really cares about their work. Every, it's like everything is excellent as opposed to everything is pretty good. They might click on some and go, yeah, not bad, not my cup of tea. I'd rather them not see my B material, only mm -hmm. my A material. So I figured quality over quantity was one. Um, and paying close attention to what people respond to. I think data analytics is a major thing. Um, but we have to check in with everybody in real life, you know what I mean? If you have a perfume that you think smells amazing and someone else, like you just notice that no one's talking to you anymore, people are distancing themselves and you wear it, you're like, huh, people only seem distant from me when I wear this perfume, maybe it's not as good as I thought, right? So getting some feedback. Um, when people aren't angry, I, I get a lot of valuable feedback from people, um, close friends, looking at the numbers. People can say nice things, but the numbers, you know, it's like, oh, this clearly resonated with people. What is it? And just trying to take a very analytical approach to understanding how things affect people, paying close attention and trying to get as specific as possible. I think that's true for almost anything though. I mean, we're both table tennis players. Ma Long isn't stopping learning, you know? Sun Ying Sha isn't stopping learning. Everybody's chasing her, so she has to keep improving to maintain her spot, right? Keep reinventing herself. So for me, I, I can't stop learning. I've got a long way to go and I'd like to continue to learn and grow. And I think challenging ourselves is an important part of growth. Um, there are a lot of things. I don't know if you remember the first time you drove a car, but for me, the first time I drove a car, it was terrifying. I'm like, I'm driving this giant metal machine and I could just make a wrong turn and kill people. Right. I have so much power. This is really so much responsibility. And I, the idea of even changing the radio station was crazy. I'm like, I must look at all mirrors. In theory, now I'd feel comfortable to drive with my knees playing Pokemon Go on two phones while talking to somebody on speakerphone and still check all the mirrors and make sure that my blinker's on and that there are no cars coming in from two lanes over. With time and experience, things become easier, like your first day on the job versus a job you've been doing for four years, right? So to continue growing, I just have to look, where am I missing? How can I improve? So I hope to continue doing that. It sounds like you, you want to always pursue excellence, right? Were you always like that? Or there was, there was a change in your life that made you to basically pay more, more attention, learning and, and being better every day? Wow. It's funny. I don't even, a lot of people say like every day I want to be better. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not so specific. <laughs> like. Uh, <laughs> Am I better today than I was yesterday? I don't know. I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. it's like, it's like your rating and, you know, table tennis. Mm -hmm. There are times if you zoom out, it's a little bit different because people, it's all relative with ratings. But if you zoom out, it's like you might have a tournament where your rating goes down a little bit 
and you're like, oh man, this is bad news. But if you zoom out, you're like, oh yeah, overall I'm going up. I just, there are dips and that's how life goes, ups and downs. And yeah, in terms of my attitude about uh, pursuing excellence and whatnot, yeah, I think uh, I'm a competitive person and maybe it's just a pride thing. This is when you, <laughs> I couldn't answer to what I'm proud about because that's tricky for me. Um, yeah, there are a lot of things I'm very happy have worked out as well as they have, and uh, I'm very thankful. In terms of pride, I take pride in what I do because maybe it's just ego. It's this idea that I want people to look at me and think quality, or I want people to think they're, I don't know, like that my, my uh, reputation, right? It's like, I want people to think positively when they meet me or even if they don't meet me that that yeah to be associated with positive things yeah I don't know if that's a survival skill just like selfishness but yeah I've been competitive for as long as I can remember um, and I guess I try to funnel that into not not being mean or not causing harm uh, yeah I guess I've taken pride in what I do for not everything. Some things I'm like, nah, it's okay. My room doesn't need to be clean. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I noticed uh, on your videos that you, whoever you do a video with, you always try to make them look good. Which yeah. Is so great. So you, you show their strengths. So definitely that's, you're doing it for others in your videos. Thanks. I'm happy you noticed that. Um, yeah, everyone loved your video and they loved you in it and everyone, yeah, I mean, my dad was a big role model and uh, he was way better at a lot of things than I'll ever be. Um, he, because he's not me, I can say this, but uh, he got a lot of awards and whenever he received awards, he almost never took credit for anything. It was always about everyone else. He was just really good at sort of making it about other people. And I think for me, like, I can talk forever, as you've seen. It's, you know, it's easy for me to talk. But on the channel, I feel like there are a lot of things I want to do. I'd like to grow the sport of table tennis. And I love table tennis. I really enjoy it. And I think it's an amazing sport. I don't know if there's any question about my passion for it. But the truth is, if I was paralyzed from the neck down tomorrow, I would have a lot to live for. And if I could never play table tennis again, I would still be excited about a lot. Because I like people and there are a lot of big ideas outside of sports that sports can just be a medium to like encouraging people comforting people sharing life with people um helping humanize people whether it's i mean there are social issues that you know i mean you've worked on many councils and as a, a woman athlete i'm sure you've encountered all sorts of issues um that i probably never will and people of different ethnicities like i just feel like there's a there's a lot of misunderstanding in the world about people that's not it's not with bad intention a lot of people just don't have a lot of exposure to different cultures or different people maybe they don't have the opportunity to travel so much or to get to know people from a certain area or on the other side of a certain language barrier maybe someone who speaks a different language so for me i'm thinking if i can humanize people um if i can show hey this hungarian woman is uh super smart super accomplished and way better than me at table tennis there's still going to be people who say things in the comment section that were like can't change everybody and maybe it's yeah, maybe you don't have to change anybody in theory, but if you can leave some examples that make people sort of inspired to go, oh, wow, yeah, that's amazing. Look at her go. Or, oh, yeah, people can do this. Or, oh, yeah, these people do have a sense of humor. Oh, I do have more in common with that person than I realized. I would have never guessed that considering they're on the other side of the globe. Uh, I think that happens all around the world, and it's just, so anything I can do, I'd like to use my platform to sort of help some of the big social issues, if you will, to humanize people. So I'm very outspoken. I don't need to make, you know, 
I put enough of myself out there that if the whole video is like, hey, check out my guest, look what my guest is doing, there will still be plenty of time for people to learn about me. I'm in every video, so I think I should give them the majority of, you know, make it about them, I think. Yeah. No, that's great. I'm just curious, what did your uh, father did or or who, who, who was he? Because you, you, oh. you just talked about him shortly, but I don't know, like, what was his, or what's his occupation or... Yeah. He, uh, he was a teacher. He was a teacher. And he got into test preparation. He became an author. And... Yeah, he was teaching a class and he was using a book and he had an idea for the author. He's like, I really like this book, but I think if they just changed this, if they did this thing here, that could be really helpful. So he wrote to the author and the author said, thank you for this. I guess my dad wrote it in a very mindful way that wasn't like, hey, you suck at your job. <laughs> this, you know, you could make this better. You should. It wasn't like that. It was like, hey, I love your work. So the guy's listening right away and said, I've been using your book for years and years and I'm a big fan. I had an idea. I'm not an expert in this field, so I don't know if it resonates. But if it's something that you like, I just thought maybe this could be um, a positive addition or something. And the author responded very warmly and said, not only is that a great idea, uh, I'd love to meet with you about it. My dad was like, really? So the guy invited my dad over for dinner and he brought my mom and he was expecting some big fancy house because it was an author of a book that my dad had used. The guy must be rich. He wasn't, but it was still nice enough. And the guy said, not only do I like your idea, um, but everything that you've said, I think you should write it yourself. You want to write that portion of the book? My dad was like, really? You think they'd let me? He's like, I know the publisher as well. Yeah, you can be a contributing author. And my dad tried it, and it went over really well, and so they offered him his own book, writing test preparation books. So throughout his career, he ended up writing test preparation books a lot, and he was a big believer that people from poverty areas or people that uh, yeah, didn't have as much money should be able to get test preparation, or else the cycle won't be broken. You know, rich people can afford all the tutors in the world, and other people who are smart people, they just don't have coaches teaching them exactly how to take tests. They're going to get lower test scores, then they won't be able to qualify for schools to get high paying jobs, and it'll just make the separation between the rich and the poor greater. So my dad was big on making very affordable test preparation. And he paid all his uh, teachers very well. He started a company, had his friends and people that he liked and thought were good people, good teachers. He paid them well and he charged very little for the classes, so he was a bad businessman because that's not a good way for profit, but he was a generous man and he would tutor people for free. He loved sports and if he saw athletes that weren't doing well in school, he would do what he could to help them out no matter their background and that was most of his career. He wrote a few sports books as well because he was a uh, big sports guy. He was Mr. Baseball. He was the reason I got into table tennis. He loved it. So you, you got into table tennis because of your dad? Yeah. He brought us up. You know, I played baseball, basketball, and soccer, or football, depending on where in the mm -hmm. world you are. Um, yeah, from the time I was quite young, from four and a half. And uh, I think I started playing ping pong on the driveway around seven years old. And at 15, I was still playing baseball, basketball, and soccer, and I started playing tournaments for table tennis. But by 17, that was my last year playing baseball for the school, and I continued with table tennis. And Yeah, but my dad was uh, really big on sports, and um, I guess he was a math PhD. He really liked math and reasoning and critical thinking, and so he was always... He was always playing devil's advocate. Do you know that term? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Actually, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> Awesome. Be the devil's advocate. All the time. So that's, yeah. I have this habit of provoking people mm -hmm. now. Someone will say something. Yeah, I noticed that in, <laughs> I like, shouldn't have told you, you make people comfortable, right? <laughs> sometimes I make people really uncomfortable because I'm always, it's like my impulse to challenge them, be like, is that always true? But what about this? You know, my dad would do that to us all the time to really keep us thinking. And it got us sharp and at times it got us frustrated mm -hmm. and emotional at the dinner table. Like, God, like dad just... Let us have our opinions, you know? <laughs> I can't prove it. I just 
I know inside or I don't know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so it was interesting. Um, but yeah, that my dad was uh, a man of the community. You know, he was coaching. He was doing helping organizations and uh, trying to help people a lot and yeah kept really busy and was very involved with a lot of different sports organizations and educational stuff as well. Sounds like a very uh, inspiring person. (laughs) And he was a great public speaker and he had a sharp (laughs) sense of humor. Yeah he was really funny. So uh, now he brought a lot of humor into the house for sure. Oh he passed that to you right? Do you like humor? (laughs) I made him roll his eyes. Man, I did some things. Even late in his life, he got sick. And uh, when I spent a lot of time with him when he was sick, I realized he might not have that long. And uh, fortunately for me, I had a very flexible job as an actor and, you know, a guy working in restaurants. I could just, you know, a few days a week, no problem. I could be with my dad. So I spent a lot of time with him uh, over the years, especially when he was sick, not just for my dad, but for my mom. Uh, she had a lot on her shoulders to be, I mean, I can't even imagine watching someone, you know, that you've spent your whole life with and formed a family with just sort of like withering away and dying. Uh, yeah, so I knew my mom would need emotional support. And uh, anyway, my sense of humor from time to time, <laughs> I think they, I've never been big on drinking. It's never really been my thing. And uh, I forgot if there was some wine at the table one night and I took a sip and then like pretended to get like just I fell out of my chair as a joke and I like completely flipped the chair pretending I was drunk. And my dad wasn't so entertained by it. <laughs> he was like, Adam, please. I'm like, sorry, I thought it'd be funny. <laughs> anyway, that's a time to time that happened. But yeah, my dad, my dad had a great sense of humor. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you definitely using your humor as well, so Thanks. what you do. My other question would be, um, did you have any mentors or who were your mentors? Yeah, I didn't even really learn that, like I knew of the term mentor and I've heard... Or a coach or who was, who was helping your way where you are at right now. Yeah, it's sort of back to the inspiration thing, like I'll take it wherever I can get it. I mean, if I can learn something from mm-hmm. someone, and I almost always can, uh, yeah, I should. You know, I think there are, I don't know if I'd say diamonds in the rough, but there are a lot of, I'm, I'm sure I take plenty of things for granted, but I try to, yeah, I try not to. And I try to learn from people where I can and learn from my mistakes. In terms of mentors, I had a high school theater teacher um, that I would say was life changing. And I don't know, I would just, It's a magical man, just like the most fascinating guy. I knew right away, I'm like, there's something special about this teacher. I don't know, it just, everything, like he just had a way about him that really resonated with me. I'm like, how is he so patient? It was very peculiar. He's so eloquent, he's so encouraging. And I think encouragement is an incredibly valuable thing for, I mean, (laughs) It's, it's important. It's powerful. Um, I believe that for almost everything. Um, and I try, you know, when I was coaching table tennis, some people, uh, like kids know this, like if people always ask me, what was my favorite subject in school? My answer was always the subject that came easiest to me, that I felt like I was the best at, mm-hmm. right? And that's common. Most people's least favorite subject is the one they struggle with the most. Mm-hmm. But what if the one they struggled with the most, they got encouragement and someone didn't say, you know, Adam, you're holding up class. Or I was gonna say, Dora, like, sorry, talk to me after class. We don't have time to continue answering your questions about this. You know, the rest of the class has moved on. Well, you know, you're gonna feel bad about yourself. And be like, geez, I guess I'm stupid then. So maybe this isn't my thing. Maybe I should try something else. But if someone said to you like, that's a wonderful question, Dora. That's really good. Um, Let's dig into that a little deeper later after class because I think that's a very interesting question. You might not feel guilty. You might be you might even feel special. Wow, I asked a great question, you know, and with table tennis, maybe someone's really slow. They just don't move their feet well, but their feeling is so good. And you can say, "Wow, you have incredible control." The person's a first timer playing table tennis, they might be like, "Wow, I have incredible control." I never thought of myself as athletic. I mean, I'm the chubbiest kid in class. 
I'm the slowest in running the mile. I never thought sports were for me, but yeah, I guess I do. I'm really good at touching the ball, I have great control. This is for me. Like people tend to grab, like encouragement is just so powerful and important. So my theater teacher, Mr. Gilchrist, um, I lose track of his age, uh, but he's gotta be 85-ish. Um, every time I go back to LA, I make it a priority to see him early on. And we hang out and time loses itself. It's like, when it gets dark out, I'm like, okay, I'll walk around until he goes to bed early. So I'll stay with him until he says, you know, I think uh, maybe I should call it a night. But it's always, it's always so lovely. It's just a real treasure. It's like everything else, he makes worries melt away. It's amazing. And he always has. So I think I went for maybe like a seven year period where I didn't talk to him. I got busy in college and was so involved with everything around me and in front of me. And then I just thought, why did I ever stop talking to Mr. Gilchrist? And I reached out to him and we picked up right where we left off. And uh, yeah, I don't know how long he'll be around, but everything he's taught me has, uh, will stick with me for a long time. And I often think to myself, what would he do? I have mentors in other ways. Uh, yeah, it's a fine line, you know. There's one person that I call a mentor. He actually said, are you comfortable if we have a mentor or whatever relationship? And I said, I think we sort of already do, don't we? He goes, yeah. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. And this person's offered me very sound advice through many tough times uh, or stressful things like work-related things, negotiations, how to not burn bridges, which is a bit of an art that if you're outspoken sometimes, you accidentally burn a lot of bridges. Mm -hmm. So living and learning. But yeah, I've had uh, mentors. I even had a life coach briefly, which was funny because it was someone I met on a dating app. Like we matched and she was a life coach. And um, I need to be careful about how much I say, but the short of it was she said, do you mind if I coach you a little bit? I said, not at all. Are you kidding me? I could never afford you. If you want to, <laughs> sure, I'm open. You're an expert. I'll take whatever. Yeah, sure. And she was very empowering. And I sort of wonder what she's up to now and how life is and hope she's doing well. But uh, and, and imagine she is. But yeah, she. there are stories still that like I'll never forget some of the things she said that made me go, yeah, yeah. And like I had a stronger respect for myself because of things that she said. Um, and I guess I try to surround myself with people that do make me feel that way. Not to say I get really good constructive criticism from close friends and family. And I need to be open to it. Because if I'm not, like, it's nice to get patted on the back or rewarded. But if you don't work on your weaknesses, you're leaving some giant holes in your game, metaphorically speaking, you know. So, yeah. I hear some tough things from time to time from people that I love and respect and yeah, I just have to go, yeah, try to think as objectively as possible and go, I think you're right. I should try to work on that, you know. But yeah, I've had mentors. That's the... <laughs> <laughs> I like you always, you know, you always give a very good and detail-oriented answer. So I love that. That's, Thanks. That's great. Um, that's awesome. And um, this would be my last question, but this is so great. I'm really enjoying it. And oh, good. Thank you so much for sharing. My last question would be that, what are your future plans or what would you like to do? I'd like to get old. <laughs> yeah, I plan to do that. Uh, so far, so good. It's happening all the time. <laughs> for uh, everyone. <laughs> yeah, most people, if we're lucky. Uh, yeah, for the lucky ones, right? Yeah. Yeah, we have to be grateful. I mean, to yeah. be healthy for sure. Yeah. Plans for the future, I have lots. Um, to get specific, it's tricky because I'm very open to a variety of things happening. And I think part of that is I have goals, um, like continuing to learn, continuing to improve as a person in my relationships with other people, um, to how I treat people, family and friends, to just being very honest with other people and myself about what is working and what isn't working and when I need help and when I don't and when I feel healthy and when I don't. Um, keeping that balance and the balance of thinking about other people, not always making it about me. I think 
like this is an interview. As soon as you told me, you know, oh, I don't want to talk about me much. Uh, and I was like, oh, man. Because recently, like when, when people start to give you that type of attention, it's easy to get used to talking about yourself. But then you go back and see family, and maybe it's like they want you to ask how they are and hear what's going on with them too. Maybe it's just a new tomato grew on the plant, and uh, that's something that's big for my mom, and I should be there for her to hear about it. Um, that wasn't that she has other things going on in her life, but plans for the future. Well, I'd like to develop the YouTube channel and diversify that as well. Meaning, hypothetically, my YouTube channel could get hacked. I could get something could happen to my channel. I would like to grow and like my ability to help positively affect people, to inspire people, to help grow the sport. Um, yeah, I have a lot of ideas for the sport. Um, maybe, we'll see. I don't know if TV shows, I mean, streaming services are a major thing. TV shows might be a thing of the past. Maybe a series, but I have a lot of ideas. I'd like to develop different parts of the world in table tennis. Um, I would like to bring that to a lot of people. And yeah, also important, helping people understand people, learn about people, uh, humanize people, give people a voice who maybe could use a little bit of a megaphone or an amplifier to what they have to say to help. I mean, first I have to gain perspective. It's also good to talk to people and learn from them because then I can just be like, don't take it from me, <laughs> listen to her, you know? This is her story. Well, check it out for yourself. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like kids a lot, um, but having children and raising children is quite a commitment and a very commendable job. I mean, it's something that people do that's incredibly expensive, incredibly time consuming, and really challenging. And yet, my mom and dad did that for me, my sister, and my brother. And people continue to do it all the time. And they live through it, even for a few months of sleepless nights, you know, a few hours here and there where they can get it. I don't know. I don't know if that's in my future or not. Um, we'll see. But in the meantime, I think I like meeting people. Um, I like collecting stories, learning, and plans for the future. I mean, a lot, but they're not like plans, plans. They're like ideas, and then I'll prioritize and see how things go. It's, it's all trial and error, you know. I'm sure I'll learn that some of my plans are need to be compromised a little bit, or maybe even better, they can be improved upon. And I'm like, oh, maybe I combine these two things, and this will work, or this works, this doesn't. Why don't I stick with this? I find this really rewarding. I thought this would be rewarding, and eh, it's not so rewarding. Maybe I've hit my limit for how much fulfillment this gives me, so maybe I should pursue this because it makes me feel better about how I spend my time. You know, I think it's just a constant trial and error, you know, finding a balance life seems to be like a, a balancing act and maybe a transitional phase. So I'm always transitioning and trying to adjust. And I guess if other people have the same goals as me in terms of getting old or staying alive, <laughs> then whatever plans I have for the future, those who care to see hopefully will, and those who don't, no problem. And yeah, we'll see. But I think you'll be around for a while, so maybe I'll answer your question with <laughs> actions instead of words. Yes, you know, I would love to see that. And sure. uh, I will follow up. You have a very non traditional lifestyle, right? You're yeah. traveling around the world, so it has to fit in it as well. Yeah, I think uh, being flexible, being able to roll with the punches a bit is an important skill to develop, and I'm still working on it, as always. But uh, yeah. I, there, there are just so many, when you have a lot of ideas, it's like with a finite amount of time, the ability to prioritize yeah. is, can be challenging, you know? So I'm working on that and trying to get help with that as well. And sometimes finding someone who can help is really important. But yeah, I think a lot of ideas and we'll see, we'll see what's next and how things go, but I'm excited. I'm also excited and thank you so much, Adam. It was wonderful and thank you for what you do. Thank and you. Keep it going. Thanks for having <laughs> me, Dora. Thank you.
I hope you got a lot of value from this episode. Thank you for listening. I have included a link in the description below where you can get a free copy of my high performance ebooks to help you to take your performance to the next level. Until next time, take care.